Okay. So uh, since I don't know many of you here, I thought I'd first start with a brief introduction to who I am. Uh, I started out my career as a theoretical computer scientist studying approximation algorithms. And over the years, I've developed into uh, focusing on problems that have an economic bent as well as a computational bent. And so I study, like, the, I try to design algorithms that have good incentive properties for the agents that uh, are participating in the algorithms. And I feel like computational sustainability is a great application area for my set of expertise because at its heart there are some, there's a human element involved and we have to worry about the behavior of the human element uh, in our design. So um, I traditionally have studied things like social networks and I have a separate project I'd be happy to talk to you about. Uh, about spreading information about HIV and social networks. This is joint with Melinda and his group. I also have uh, traditionally worked a lot in market design, um, things like uh, kidney exchange markets or stable matching markets. And I have a poster outside, which I will take down shortly, um, <laughs> about uh, looking at uh, the design of an agricultural market in Uganda where we're matching subsistence buyers, uh, uh, sellers of agriculture, so subsistence farmers, to buyers that will go around and collect the agriculture and sell it at the central markets. Um, so quite happy to talk about those projects and other sustainability interests of mine with you offline. Uh, but for this talk, I wanted to tell you about uh, optimal patrol routes for forest rangers. And this is joint work with Bobby Kleinberg, who's um, currently at Microsoft Research uh, on sabbatical from Cornell and is coming back here in the fall. Uh, so I first heard about this problem when I invited Malin to Microsoft to give a colloquium and he told us about this problem of trying to patrol forests for uh, traps to prevent poaching. And, uh, you know, as a theoretical computer scientist, what I do is I abstract the problem away into, like, simple enough that I can solve it. So this is my abstraction of what it means to patrol forests. Uh, you have a forest which has a bunch of cells, and in each cell, uh, there's traps appear. Um, there, there could be some traps that already exist. Poachers come around and they lay potentially more traps in the forest cells. And then, you know, periodically these traps snare animals and become deactivated. And the patrol routes will go around and patrol forest cells. And when they patrol a cell, they collect and deactivate uh, all the traps in the cell that they, that they patrol. Uh, and then this repeat process repeats day after day. And the problem of the patrols is to maximize the number of traps that they collect. So this is clearly a highly simplified version of the problem. Uh, you have many other complications, which I will touch on briefly at the end of the talk. But I'd like to th you to think about this as a first stab at solving this problem computationally, and uh, that we can add on layers of complexity um, as we get closer and closer to the application. Um, so some of the complexities I'd like to discuss in the context of this talk are that there are limited resources, so I can't collect all the traps from all the cells every day. Rangers can only visit a limited number of forest cells each day. Uh, and I'll spend most of the talk discussing how to deal with even that very simple problem. Uh, Additionally, we don't really know what the ranger's activity is. So they're laying down traps and cells, and I don't know the frequency with which they lay down traps, perhaps, or, um, and even more importantly, if I patrol a particular cell, I learn something about the traps in that cell and the like, rate of which traps get deposited in that cell, but very little about the cells I don't visit. And so how can we collect a large number of traps while exploring the forest enough to learn about the cells that probably have low output of traps. Um, and finally, uh, there's this issue of strategic poachers. So once I plan a patrol route uh, as a ranger, I need to worry about the fact that the poachers are going to react to what I've planned to do. And so th there's really some sort of game going on here between the poachers and the rangers. And the first two steps, in a sense, are the uh, calculating the best response of the rangers to a fixed strategy of the poachers. So this should be thought of as some element in an iteration of some game. 
Uh, also, I would like to point out that if you have a good way to learn about the unknown activity, and poachers are perhaps boundedly rational, and hence their behavior is just drifting over time, then even just solving these first two bullets is going to give you a good uh, solution to the problem at hand. Um, so, I like to think about this problem, I call it the leaky drawers problem. It's, it's basically for, so I don't know the background of people in this room pretty much at all, except for David. Um, so uh, if this doesn't make sense to you, it's not super important, but I like to think about this problem as a multi-armed bandit problem in which the drawers are leaky. So multi-armed bandits are, you know, you have a casino which has a whole bunch of bandits like, being slot machines with arms. And you can think about this problem as the slot machines are just constantly depositing coins into a drawer. And you walk into the casino and you have to pick which drawer you're gonna empty into your bag. And uh, the drawers are leaky, so they lose coins over time. So the rate of accumulation is some sort of concave function. And the goal of the uh, gambler here is to choose a sequence of drawers that they're going to collect coins from in order to maximize the number of coins that they collect. Uh, mapping that back to the forest problem, we think about each cell as being one arm of this multi-arm bandit. And the uh, leakiness is because traps catch animals and or break down and become deactivated. So uh, in order to, for the context of this talk, I would like to introduce a particular model about how traps appear and, and disappear from these forest cells. Uh, most of our results can be generalized to other functions for how these uh, traps appear and disappear. But for the context of this talk, I'm going to think about each cell as having a cell-specific probability with which a trap appears each day and uh, a cell-specific probability with which a trap disappears each day or becomes deactivated. You could think about this as the rate at which animals walk into traps if they're single-use traps or the rate at which traps are uh, becoming uh, are no longer operational. Yes? Just so I understand, you're not rewarding the person for giving a trap that's already been sprung? No, I'm only rewarding the ranger for collecting traps uh, that have not sprung. So they're deactivating traps. So I'm thinking about this as saving the maximum number of lives, like uh, animals that would have otherwise died. Um, and, but nonetheless, I, this framework is generic enough, and I'll discuss that later, to solve problems like looking for poacher activity where the signs of the poacher activity degrade over time, for example. Okay, so and uh, I'm thinking about the very limited resource case in which the rangers can only collect traps in one cell each day. Um, so this problem, I, I, I'm assuming right now that I know these probabilities pi and delta i. So this problem looks really simple to uh, most people, right? You think, well, I know the last time I visited this cell, I know the probability with which traps are laid every day and the probability with which they decay. So I can calculate the expected number of traps in each cell. That's a very simple geometric sum that I can write down. We'll call that function h. Uh, so if every day, uh, if the last time I visited it was ti days ago, and every day a trap is laid with probability pi and decays with probability one minus delta i, that should be a delta i, then this would be the expected number of traps after, if I last visited it ti days ago. And so a very naive approach to this problem would be to simply do a greedy patrol. Each day I'm going to just visit the cell with the largest number of expected traps. So this seems like a sort of knee-jerk reaction. And in fact, most people I tell this problem to are like, well, obviously that's the optimal strategy. And it's not. Uh, so here's a simple example that shows that greedy is suboptimal. You could have just two forest cells. In the first cell, you're laying a trap every day for sure. So the ranger knows there's every day a trap appears in the first forest cell. In the second forest cell, a trap appears with probability half. And let's say that traps decay in both cells at a rate of a half. Now, if you saw, like, look at that geometric uh, sum, what you'll realize is that no matter how much time has gone since you last visited the second cell, there's always, you always expect to see more traps in the first cell even if you visited that cell yesterday. So the greedy policy is going to be to simply visit the first cell forever and never touch the second cell. But a clearly better policy would be to alternate cells. And why is that? Well, in the cell that lays a trap with every 
uh, every day. If you wait a day to visit it, you still get a trap for sure, and you lose the trap from the day before with probability half, but you still get it with probability half. So you get a payoff of one and a half by visiting the first cell every other day. And that leaves you some space to visit the second cell. Um, and that gives you some payoff. Uh, and we can calculate that and see that your per day payout from this schedule is 9 eighths, whereas your per day payout from the greedy schedule was just 1. So it turns out that this example can be made a bit worse. We can make it as bad as a uh, 2 approximation. And we can prove that's tight using some connections to combinatorial auction theory. Uh, basically, the traps, uh, the benefit of allocating, you can think about the days as items, and the benefit of allocating a particular item or day to a particular forest cell is a submodular function of the set of days that were previously allocated to that cell. And so uh, we get a, that greedy is a two approximation, but uh, economists are never satisfied with constants, so let's see if we can do better. Um, another approach that I think is pretty interesting is a linear programming approach. So it took us a while to figure out how to write down this linear program. In particular, the variables are a little bit tricky to explain. Uh, I'm going to have a variable xit for every cell i and potential delay t, where xit indicates the fraction of times that cell i is visited after a delay of at least t days. So here, for example, I often think definitions are better defined through example. I have a schedule with two cells where I visit cell one every fourth day and cell two in between. So cell one, uh, the fraction of times it's visited after a delay of at least one is one quarter in every step of four. And the, after a delay of at least two is one quarter, a delay of at least three is one quarter, and a delay of at least four is one quarter. So the variable corresponding to x1 t for t from 1 to 4 is 1 quarter. And for x2, uh, we can look at the delays as being uh, the fraction of times I visited after a delay of at least 1 is 3 quarters, right? I only don't visit it after a delay of at least 1 here. That, that was a delay of 2. And so this is 3 quarters of the time I'm visiting it after a delay of at least 1. And 1 quarter of the time I'm visiting it after a delay of at least 2. So those are my variables. And I can write down some constraints. Uh, this, each cell is visited. I visit at most one cell every day. So that gives me a constraint that looks like this. Notice that one of the benefits of linear programming here is if I wanted to uh, add on features to my problem, like I can visit C cells per day, I can just include that in the constraints. Um, because of the way that XIs are defined, they have to be monotone. And there's this uh, constraint that's a little bit difficult to explain, um, which says that the uh, frequencies with which I visit things can't be too high. Yeah? So I'm trying to interpret your uh, indices. So T is I specific. This is yeah, how many X. I so for every day, for every potential delay in every cell, I have a variable XIT. So if if uh, x i t is, if x one t is one quarter, it's saying every one in four days I have to make sure I visit this thing. So yeah. Is it essentially the distribution of the delays once I visit this thing? Yes. Like yes. It is building likelihood it's a dis it's the cumulative distribution of the delays. Distribution, so likelihood, max, uh, a, a empirical likelihood. Yes, uh, yeah. uh, and in fact, um, the. the OK, well, I guess, in fact, I'm going to use that in the rounding scheme. But <laughs> before I get there, it is. So, so the sum of xi ones equal to 1, right? What, what does it mean after a delay of 1? It means that every xi ones equal to 1 means that each day I can visit just one thing. So I can't visit everything with a, a, every day, right? If, if, these were, if all of the xi ones were 1, this sum would far exceed its constraints, and then it would mean that I'm visiting everything every day, which is infeasible. So this kind of this captures that, and uh, the constraints I can I don't really have time to explain fully in a 15-minute talk. I'd be happy to tell you offline, but they're all linear. This is all the constraints we have in our LP. This is the objective function. Um, again, I don't 
really have time to explain this, but notice that I'm assuming these H functions, which were the amount of traps after in cell I after a delay of T in expectation, these, if they're known, then this is a linear program. These can, and I didn't really need this to have a geometric form, right? Any sort of shape here would be fine. Um, and in order to solve this LP, uh, you know, I have now have a linear program. Uh, if you know anything about discrepancy theory, it's not true that any set of variables can be rounded. So this LP has an integrality gap. But I can round, as uh, Tanya was suggesting, using this interpretation of the XIs as distributions. I can just flip a coin every day, looking at the frequency with which I'm supposed to schedule it. And that is going to give me a schedule. So every day I look at these XI1 variables. I flip a coin to decide which thing to schedule, well, which I, which cell I to visit, and that will give me a randomized schedule which has a 1 minus 1 over E fraction uh, of the traps collected by the opt. Um, so it's a constant approximation, but better than uh, And I just want to briefly touch on the, one of the assumptions I made here was that I knew those H functions. So what if I didn't? What if the probability, the frequency with which traps are laid is unknown, which seems reasonable in the poaching problem. That is something that's not too hard to deal with using standard machine learning techniques. I can do this sort of upper confidence bound trick where I schedule some number of days, some sublinear number of days to just exploring all the cells to learn what these PIs are. And then I can use my linear programming approach, and that will guarantee me some constant fraction of the op minus an additive term, which I lose during my exploration phase. And there's standard techniques uh, that practitioners use to sort of distribute these exploration phases over the course of the entire time that the program is running. Um, so I've you know, discussed a bit about how I'm dealing with uh, limited resources and this poaching problem. When I, even when I know the rates at which cells accumulate, at which traps accumulate in cells, finding the optimal patrol route is not trivial. I actually don't know that it's NP hard. Um, I have several, we have like four or five different constant approximations for this problem, and we're working on trying to come up with a PTAS. Now, of course, this. Uh, Solution didn't take into account the fact that the routes have to make sense in the forest. So that would be another layer of complexity that we could add on to that. We have some ideas about how to deal with that using a graph theoretic formulation of the problem um, and looking for uh, like loops of large weight. Um, and okay, so then the, I touched briefly on what to do when there's unknown activity. Uh, we had a t to the two-thirds regret algorithm. Uh, we would, that was sort of the most straightforward thing you could do. You could hope to try and improve the bounds of the on the regret. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the key problems here is that the poachers are perhaps reacting to the patrols, although we've heard some conflicting evidence about the degree to which that's actually happening. Um, and so, one thing I, I want to note is that the solving this problem is a best response in this game, but also uh, if the poachers don't react too quickly, then having a low regret learning algorithm will help you uh, stay one step ahead of the poachers, essentially. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, like being a, theory, right, a theorist and generalizing problems has the uh, benefit that you could hope to apply it to other optimization problems, for example, removing invasive species where the species accumulate at some rate that's dependent on the number of species in that cell currently. Um, or another thing that Bobby and I are interested in is recommendation algorithms where like you go to uh, Spotify and it recommends a song for you to listen to and if you listen to it yesterday you're kind of bored of it. So you need to wait a while for your desire for that song to recharge. Um, so thank you. So one thing I suspect is true <coughs> for the structure of an optimal solution for most of the models is that it'll be ultimately periodic. So have you thought about uh, have you thought about a configuration style LP that thinks about bounded period as sort of the mechanism to um, 
Yeah, so our, so our sort of step towards a PTAS is to uh, bound the period and then just make sure, like, I visit, I, I round robin through them in between periods to make sure that I never let the delays get too large. Um, and this causes there to be too many states in the way we've set it up. Like, uh, there will be exponentially many variables, or like, uh, we're even just thinking about it as a sort of Gra a graph optimization problem and there's exponentially many nodes. But if we were trying to split the cells into the heavy ones and the light ones and then do that for the heavy ones and try to slot the light ones in, but I don't even know that opt is periodic. No. No. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, you clearly you can get a PTAS with a periodic schedule. Though. And the one minus one maybe is tight in that LP? Uh, no, we are, our like integrality gap is 1817 or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> we have only had one very quick question. Yeah? So for the strategic uh, portion, are you going to be looking at adversarial, uh, multi arm bandit or restless bandit or something like that? Uh, we haven't really thought much about the strategic portion yet. I'm, I would like to understand better how to model the strategic reaction of the poachers. Like, um, you had a student yesterday talking about some sort of bounded rationality models for them and uh, I guess my intuition is if their behavior drifts slowly enough over time, if my learning is efficient enough that I can, I can just, you know, stay ahead of them without reacting too much. And also, like, in some sense, the fact that our solution is randomized should, I think, help them, like, it takes them longer to react to us because we're doing something randomized. So, as a side, if you're looking at it as, a, as, as cumulative probabilities, uh, distribution of, of delays, then you can essentially predict the delay. You can look at it as an empirical uh, likelihood distribution, and then your mode is a con conditioned on the last appearance, right on the last collection. The mode is the highest probability predictor for the next. We can, yeah. we I mean, that, that's what the, uh, yeah, yeah. the right. two-thirds so regret algorithm is basically doing. Right, and so you can do, but but you can you can now take it away and just look at it as an empirical uh, likelihood uh, probability <coughs> distribution. And yeah, it's not pretty, but it's a starting point in the bomb. Yeah. yeah. So Even with a dynamic strategy. Sorry. With the, on the part of the poacher, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We still have a lot of questions we will discuss uh, after the, all the talks. So next talk. <laughs>